All right. I uh, want to say thank you for everybody to come in, for coming today. Um, my name is Tom Katsanias. I'm the National Director for University Partnerships and Veteran Affairs um, for Trident University. Um, Trident University is very proud to um, sponsor Kimberly Furrier today um, to give you the presentation. Um, she is the Vice President for Talent Development for American Cancer Society. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you, Trident, for having me. Um, one of the uh, one of the strategies that we've deployed in American Cancer Society is how can you get to cool things like this and not use donor dollars? So thank you, Trident, for making that happen. My donor dollars are safe. They're not providing my vacation in Carlsbad. I mean, my work in Carlsbad. <laughs> uh, no, seriously, we've been partners with Trident for a couple years, and they're wonderful to work with. Um, so I really appreciate them hosting and giving me a chance to talk a little bit about the learning culture at the American Cancer Society and the work we've done to create a learning culture. It's so interesting to me, especially coming off the heels of the panel discussion, we've got one of the panelists in the room in fact, talking about um, you know, how, do you be, how do you adapt and how do you change and how do you be agile with your business um, when it's changing faster than you can change your content. And I think fundamental to that is a learning culture. And it's so... These days, it's so less about the training event and more about the learning experience. And so we'll talk a little bit about what we've done at the American Cancer Society to make that happen. You have a worksheet. I assumed that since I stand between you and the 530 networking reception, I should try to get you guys engaging um, with yourselves and thinking about your companies as much as possible. And plus, I want it to be useful to you. So feel free to ask questions as we go along. Um, if you have something, don't, don't wait till the end. Let's just talk about it. That's me. So what to expect? <laughs> We're going to talk. start with um, personal mastery, vision, and your contribution to a shared vision. You, uh, when we get into this discussion around learning culture, Peter Senge really is the, kind of the father of learning organizations and learning culture. And one of the tenets that he puts forward is that you have to lead yourself before you can lead others. We'll talk quickly about that, the strategies we use at ACS to create a learning culture. I'm going to talk about it largely in context with my team, but we use the same strategies that we use with my team, with other teams in the organization, and try to embed it everywhere. And we put, put it embedded in some of our programs and then practical implementation ideas for you to take home with you. So, if, if you were looking for the metric session, not here, <laughs> but we're going to have some fun. So, starting, what is a learning culture? What is a learning organization? So this is the traditional definition put forward by Peter Senge. You can see it's you know, really about an experience, transforming that experience into knowledge and making the knowledge accessible and usable throughout the organization. But that's, you know, you, you're, that's kind of yawny, right? You're going to think, oh, who wants to have that on a post-it note or a, a, a flyer that's stuck on my desk? A learning culture really is all about you. What are you trying to create as a learning leader? What are you trying to create with and through your team for your organization? And so I believe that one of the first things that you have to do is start with a learning culture definition that's yours. At the American Camp Society, this is our learning culture statement. It's a wordle. We built it together. It's fundamental to the work that we perform as a team. And it's part of the, our kind of rite of passage when someone joins the team. They get the wordle. We talk about the learning culture. It's part of our, our how we interact and, and work together. And you see <coughs> crazy terms <coughs> up there like chaotic. Sometimes life's chaotic. You have to be able to adjust and adapt to it. Customer, um, customer centric, attitude, team focused success, all these words for us define the culture that we live and that we create on our team. So, getting you straight into the worksheet and kind of thinking about it for yourself, I'd like to give you a couple minutes um, to define a learning culture for yourself. So, the first kind of three, four bullets, um, I'd like you to take a minute and just kind of spend a little couple minutes thinking about it for yourself. How are you leading a learning culture? What are you doing to create it? Are you producing knowledge? Does your organization have capabilities as a result of that knowledge they didn't have before? Do you share it? Do you make it accessible? And is your learning relevant? So those are four questions kind of to get you started in thinking about how you show up as a learning culture leader and how your organization is doing in learning culture. So my suggestion is let's give you five minutes to kind of spend a little bit of time on this. 
and then we'll talk about it as a group. Sound good? Okay. Just questions kind of to get you started, to get your, your brain thinking about uh, where you are as a leader and where your, your organization is as a, as a leader uh, in terms of learning organization. What were some of the things that uh, were both either positive or uh-oh, ahas for you as you answered those questions for yourself? I always tell you that I've known from the beginning that our organization is not a learning organization, and that's just a really huge challenge that we have. Great. It hasn't been supported um, very well in the past, and we have gone through some major leadership changes over the last, I mean, we've had three CEOs in the last three years. Mm -hmm. So, with, right, and, uh, and a complete uh, leadership change overall, overall um, in the past year and a half. So. Uh, we've probably done a, a we're, we're, <laughs> we're still trying to figure it out, I think, now, <laughs> what the direction right, yeah. is, and yeah. Okay. So that's an interesting point, um, and if I was being a fully transparent, or yes, I will be fully transparent, I don't work in an organization whose leadership leads from a learning organization perspective. And I've come to call it guerrilla talent development. You, know, you stay below the tree line, you just stay out of attention, you just do good work for places where you can. Um, and, and so you know, sometimes you sometimes you have the gift of a, of a leader of a, of a C-suite that really get it. They buy it. They drink the Kool-Aid. You know they care less about the data and more about the people. And sometimes you have an organization where it's, you don't get that. And we but you have your reality. And so it, it, in ter in terms of leading culture, leading learning culture, you have to find the places where you can influence. And so for me, it's been in lower level leaders. My, kind of my, uh, just below the C-suite is where we work, and we work there to create a learning culture, and my team to create a learning culture, which then goes out and creates learning culture in smaller pockets. You know, culture grows from the bottom up, so that's one of the ways that we've been approaching it for the last six and a half years with the American Cancer Society. But knowing your reality is critically important, we'll get into that a little bit. Other thoughts or comments? Aha. Uh -huh. No one's willing to share at 4.30 on the Did you raise your hand? Yeah. I was going to say, Thank I you. love the question, have you built structures in place that test the yeah. status quo? Yeah. yeah. So that was a great question. Mm -hmm. and I, you know, I had some yes answers to that, so I really appreciated the opportunity to think about it, but it also made me think, what else can you put in place? Yeah. And you, where can you ask those questions, both internal to your team or external with your client, internal clients? Where can you ask those questions? Is another powerful way to use that that kind of thought. So thank you for sharing. Yeah. Another interesting thing that you do. So. Well, um, I think it, I think it could go either way. What my experience is is that culture may have started at the top down, but if you don't engage and you don't embed in your people, the, the vast majority of your people, what you're trying to create in terms of culture, it doesn't matter what your executives say. So um, a good example with uh, the American Cancer Society is that we have this mindset, which is part of how we're trying to change our culture. We've gone through a huge transformation around collaboration. So that's what they told us. But they didn't change the process systems or nature of the business below. So it doesn't actually matter what your C-suite says is culture unless it impacts what your staff do in culture. Does that help a little bit make my, okay, yeah. So I think, it, I think a good strong leader can lead culture if they know how to work throughout the whole organization. We have a very similar experience. I'm, I'm a good one for information management association. So we're trying to push culture down, push culture change from the top. Mm -hmm. And then we, but we put it into this middle management sort of leadership group. And then as, as one of the leaders, I'm supposed to go back and convey what we're doing in this off-site meeting to the staff and the staffers, like whatever. I've got to like get this bill up, I've got to do this daily task. And they can't put it together um, because we go off on on-site for, off for, for eight hours. So I, I think to that point, your most powerful leaders in changing culture are your line managers, period. They have the largest amount of influence. And they're usually the most underserved in the organization. So, I had a hand here, Helen, and then right back here, and then we'll move on. Well, I was actually going to piggyback on that. Okay. When you were talking about um, how we, was it how you determine the learning culture, and you showed that Moodle 
and I was thinking about it, it's typically me and my my peers at the VP level who are making those decisions. So it was an interesting aha to think about how to engage either my learning organization or the entire organization on what that actually means. In terms of what the culture should be. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I guess I was sort of thinking this even during the panel discussion in terms of the challenges that you all face in terms of trying to train or trying to create a learning environment in a culture that doesn't really support that. Right. Um, trying to train in innovation in a culture that's not really innovative. Right. Right. You know, it's like trying to do communications training, one of Roger Shank's great articles, communications training in Enron. You know, mm -hmm. it's, the, it's the same kind of, kind of thing. So I just kind of wanted to throw that out and, and ask if people, you know, are experiencing that and um, maybe we can share some things to help each other. Yeah, uh, and I'm gonna, we, we will come back to that question in a couple of slides if that's okay with you. Okay, cool. If those of you who came in, I, we've got worksheets, I'd love you to have a seat. And last, last comment, then we'll move on. When I was reading your third question here is knowledge shared. Mm -hmm. And I thought about this in the panel. Mm -hmm. I believe that organizations have a propensity for not sharing yeah. information. Yeah. We keep it yes. Tied up in our little silos. Not only organizationally, but at certain levels of management or all levels of management. Absolutely. And, and we have an impulse, as I think Lamb said, to withhold information. I would agree. I think well, that's one of our challenges in the learning business. Yeah, is getting them to open those doors. Yes. And, I, and sometimes I feel like we perpetuate it because we don't want people teaching each other or sharing knowledge if we haven't vetted it or controlled it or made it corporate or polished it in, in the way that our learning organization, our learning team would want us to. And we have to get over that right now if we want to stay relevant in our organizations for sure. Because knowledge is not about a package training. Knowledge is about how we empower our staff to be successful. And, um, and so we, we're gonna talk a couple strategies of how ACS has done that, uh, kind of grassroots and and guerrilla, guerrilla child development ways. So, uh, the, the concept of a learning organization really uh, came out of Peter Sandy's work from the Fifth Discipline Handbook, which he published many, many moons ago, followed up with a handbook or a field guide, and then has continued to refine and polish the work. So, um, if you this is find, if you find this interesting, and there's some resources on the worksheet, you know, you can dig in double deep. This is, this is a, a hybrid version of how we've tactically done it. And I'll, I'll say this example, I've, I've met Peter Cup several times, and I've talked with him several times, and, and so at one point early, maybe 10 years ago, I said, well, how do you do this in an organization? And he looked at me and says, well, that's exactly what you have to figure out. <laughs> um, and so, you know, he's a researcher, he's a scientist, he works at MIT. So that's what we're doing, and that's what we're, and, and, and in a learning organization, every failure you gain something from. So if you've got a, you're up against your, your cult counterculture C-suite, what can you learn from every failure in that interaction and do differently next time? How can you be better? How can you become a learning organization despite them if you can't do it with them? The, the, fifth, the five disciplines is the name of the book. These are the five disciplines, and it really starts with you. So personal mastery is at the bottom. It's the foundation to what a learning organization is as you lead it. Shared vision, how do you enroll your people with what you're trying to create. Systems thinking, it's a way of thinking, speaking, and understanding the area, the place in which you work and live. Mental models is how we think about things that impact our system. And then team learning, how do you create an environment for shared learning, for shared cooperation, for shared knowledge sharing. So this is, <clears throat> This is the, fifth, the five disciplines as a release to that. And we're gonna talk a little bit about each one. So the first thing we're gonna talk about is personal mastery. Personal mastery is this balance of what's my reality, both personally, professionally, socially, economically, whatever. It is, it is not about job, it is about you. It's about who you are because if you can't lead yourself, then you can't lead others. Okay, probably we've all said that if we've done any leadership training of whatsoever. So really it starts with what's my aspiration? What do I want to create and 
and clarify what is most important to me. Then, my vision. Focus on the results I'm trying to create. What is my end game? What does that look like for my life? Reality, develop and apply self-knowledge and discipline. That's the, that's the absolute choice we make every day to honor our aspiration and our vision. Power is in our choice. Whatever your reality is, whether you've got a C-suite who doesn't believe in what you do, or you have the greatest leader ever, everything is around that choice in terms of how you lead yourself and how you get there, both in terms of work and personal. You know, I'm trying to run the Paris Marathon in April. I have paid my $90. <laughs> so if I don't get up and go running every Saturday morning, I have to make that choice in order to live, to live my vision, right? Make sense? So you think about personal mastery, it's really this idea of I have my reality, I'm living in it, I know what it looks like, sometimes it's great, sometimes it's not, not great, and then I have to get there through my choices. This is my personal vision statement, to live a big life, and this is my team's vision statement. So once you have a vision, personal vision, encourage your team to do that. I take my team through a vision workshop on an annual basis. Refine it, spend time with it. You want your people to be as confident in themselves as you are. You want them to lead and work through themselves, to be excited, to find joy in their work, to feel good about it. When, when we've taught this, concept in our leadership development programs at the American Cancer Society, I've had one or two people who came up to me after it and had the epiphany that they were in the wrong organization. And that's okay. Because we want those people to go feel fulfilled, and maybe when they become the CEO of Bank of America, they'll help us out a little bit of the American Cancer Society. Um, but you, you don't want employees who aren't aligned to your vision, who aren't aligned to what you're trying to create. It's a hard but honest truth for us. And so we have to really think about what we are and how does that align to the work that we're trying to do. So every year, my team refines their vision, we talk about it, and then we refine our vision. We create this together. It's a lot longer and wordier than, than I would normally, since obviously I'm simple, I keep it simple. But this is where we come to with the room of 56 people, sometimes there's more words. Key tenants here is that we're a professional learning organization. We're providing learning solutions to our clients. We work hard and we have fun. And it is, it, we live it every day. So personal mastery is really about knowing your reality, where you are, creating a vision, and working towards it, and doing the exact same thing with your team. Right? And what's good for you should be good for the collective. So I'm going to give you a second and take you back into uh, the worksheet, which is um, second, and I saw some of you kind of working ahead, but defining a learning organization. These give you some questions that you can um, practice or um, at work with yourself and then with your team uh, in terms of creating vision for yourself and for your team. And I think the first bullet on page two are the, those are the most powerful ones in my opinion. So if I had these things that I've laid out in my vision, if I have a um, professional learning organization that delivers solutions across that organization, if I had that, what would it get me? What would it get my organization? What would happen as a result of that work? So when you have a sense of where you are in terms of your personal vision, and then in terms of your shared vision, your team vision, what to really refine it, if I had that, what would it get me? If I had that, what would it get me? So, and then the second bullet is also really important, especially if you're up against some great challenges, which is refine. You cannot boil the ocean. So what can you do today? What choices can you make today to get you there, to get you there, to get you there? So in context, you can either do it in context of your personal vision, or you can do it in context of your team. I want you to spend just a couple minutes um, on these questions. Good? Some people get turned off by this concept around the language, personal mastery, vision, shared vision. Often, I businessify it for a client. Team outcome, team goal, uh, you know, call it whatever you want. The act and the art of it is still really driving you towards what you're trying to achieve as a person and what you're trying to achieve as a team and as an org organization. So knowing your client, knowing how to businessify it, Knowing how to communicate with your, you know, it's not like anything, anything we do, you have to, to put it into the language of the person you're trying to serve. 
So, you know, kind of saying that is, think of it as how do you want to customize it? You don't have to use this term. You can use whatever term works for your business. The other thing I want to comment, and here's a, a personal mastery. That concept can seem intimidating. Mastery, I don't have, you know, I don't, yeah, I don't know if I want to become a master of something or can I become a master of something. It's not really about that. It's more about when you have a shared vision with your team and when you have a personal vision for yourself, does it excite you? Are you, is it joyful to do it? Is it effortless to make decisions aligned to it? So is it effortless for me to get up and run six and a half miles in Carl's dad yesterday? No. But is it joyful to think about going to Paris in April? Yes. Um, and so I get excited about the end game and not so much about the step that I have to take. You know, I can guarantee you I'm not looking forward to the 20 mile run. But I'm really looking forward to the 26.2 mile run. Total crazy mind shift. But you have to have the journey in order to get you there. So mastery is that effortless and joy, joyness that comes from what you're trying to achieve that kind of infuses in your decisions every day. Make sense? Okay. All right. So moving on to understanding complexity and systems thinking. All right. This is a little ironic because this content alone could take, I don't know, days um, to get through, but I want to quickly set up the, the tenets of systems thinking and, um, and understanding complexity and tell you tactically how we rolled it out at the American Camp Society. The idea of systems thinking is that there is structural complexity in everything. Everything around us, our bodies, our families, our organizations, right? It's not everybody recognizes that. But that energy really goes along the path of least resistance. So think of a stream. The stream's got two sides and it's got water running down it and running down it and that's how energy is flowing in the path of least resistance. It's coming from a source to a source. It has a, it has a path, defined path. Um, what we believe in terms of our life, in terms of our organizational shared beliefs, really influence how that energy goes. Think of it as a boulder poof, dropped in the middle of the stream. The stream now has to divert around it. It's going to go around it because if you put something that is kind of counter to the structure, or you take the boulder out, and now the water is running more fluidly, more, more fast and, and pure. Um, there are always structures that you are unaware of, and there are always structures that are very obvious, and everything is, is in powerful of your choice. So what are you doing to help support energy flowing up, um, through the path of least resistance in a positive way? What are you doing to influence learning? What are you doing to create that culture? What are you doing to, to drive into that? This is just, well, me and Willie wouldn't be a talent development presentation without some kind of iceberg. But <laughs> here it is, check. Yeah. Um, as you think about systems thinking, as you think about uh, structures that get in the way of success, sometimes they're overt, we see them. Sometimes they're consciously covert, I'm not going to tell them. Sometimes they're totally unconsciously covert. Covert, And so you have to know that. You have to recognize that with the people that you're working with, the people that you're dealing with. You all have probably trained this 100 times yourself. I don't have to spend a lot of time on it. But it's a critical part of systems thinking, knowing who's dropping boulders in your stream. And are they doing it in front of you? Are they rolling them down the hill and hiding behind a tree? Or are they kind of to having somebody else throw them in the, in the stream just because they don't want you to know that they're doing it? Make sense? So knowing, being aware of who in your system is influencing behaviors, choice, what happened that your RCEO doesn't believe in learning culture? You know, what is that? And if you can, if you can begin to unearth that, maybe you can begin to answer the question. Maybe. The thing that always guides these mental models, this, this, the, the behavior that's in the system, the, the thing that guides the behavior that's in the system is the mental model. And this is called the ladder of inference. It's a very simple tool to kind of think about how, why we do what we do, how we act, how we act. So there's thousands of pieces of data coming to each one of you right now. She's tweeting, she's, got, she's listening, they're filming, someone's texting, there's laughter next door, right? There's thousands of pieces of data right now. I can only select the things I select. So I'm selecting only the most attentive participants. <laughs> um, <laughs> So you can only select what you can select. You can only select things that, that make sense to you, that you have to have a place for you. 
which leads to assumptions, which leads to conclusions, which leads to beliefs. And you do this the first time you do it, maybe you don't go straight to believe, but this pattern of behavior, this reinforcing loop, I think this is a pointer, this is a reinforcing loop. So the data we select feeds the beliefs that we have. This is entirely our political environment in America. Entirely. You see it played out on Fox and MSNBC every single day. They're selecting data that supports their beliefs, which drives actions. Okay? This is how people show up. They don't even know that this is how they show up. This is how they show up in your system. And so to be effective in influencing things, to begin to create change, to understand why they're an obstacle, why they're a boulder in the stream, you got to get all the way down to data. So if you think about discussing something with someone at the top of your ladder, if you're standing at the top of your ladder, you're kind of tedious, you're shaky, right? But if you go down, if you think of the metaphor of the ladder and you're standing at the first rung of the ladder, you're on the ground. You're more stable. Your falls aren't quite as far. So what can you do? I mean, I'll even say to my team, and they'll say to me, can you walk me down your ladder? Can you really help me understand where you, what the data is that's driving this? It creates an environment for authentic dialogue that you, that you may not ever be able to experience. And there's other trainings that do the same kind of thing. But essentially, you really want to look at what's the data that's feeding the conversation? What's the data that's creating the attitude, the belief, and the action? Make sense? So if you think about the system, the complexity of the system, you've got things that are over and over. You've got humans that have got long spent mental models. You've got systems and processes that are in place that either support or sometimes hinder. How many clicks does it take? for someone to get to a learning opportunity in your organization? Does it take one? Does it take 20? Can they find the class that they want? Is it easily organized? Does it look slick? Those are systems and processes that we all, I'm sure, grapple with every single day. So how can we create systems and processes that support both formally and informally what we're trying to create in terms of learning? Make sense? Okay. So one of the things we've done at the American Camp Society is done a beer game. So the beer game is a systems thinking game. It's a team-based simulation in which teams of four people create a beer distribution company. It is, has very clear processes and instructions. In fact, the processes and instructions are read out loud to all of the teams who are competing each, against each other simultaneously. So you're a team, and you're a team, and you're, there, you're hearing the same set of instructions at the same time. You're competing for a pot of money. Everybody who plays brings in a dollar. So I facilitated in rooms as large as 100. It's $100 that goes to the winning team. So you incent the competition, which is fascinating in terms of what it does to behavior. Fascinating. Um, it really, at, it, within the first couple of rounds, you begin to see long-standing mental models that feed actions and beliefs. I know everything, I know nothing. I'm a leader, I'm a follower. I give up or I keep, I keep trying to figure it out. It's fascinating. And once the whole, you complete the whole game, the winning team really, it comes down to they've made the best choice once every move. One choice, every move. And, and to when, they, when that's revealed, it's like, oh my God. So I don't want to tell you what it is, because if you play it, you should, you should experience it for what it is. But this is a great, great way to train systems, the complexity of systems, and tie it into how I behave in my system and structure, how I participate as a team member, what mental models are revealed when I'm competing or when I'm stressed. And it's a really um, fun way to tie a fictional system to your real life. So the debrief is, this is a system, but we're a system too. So when you make a decision here, how does it impact someone who's five moves later? And so when you begin to think about that in the context of your organization, both as a learning organization or within any of your products or property teams, we've trained a lot of our senior directors with our Relay for Life property on the beer game. Because I want them to understand when I make this decision without field input, what happens to my, field, to my field staff? This is, I think, one of the most important things that we can do to create a learning organization because it shifts the mindset from I know 
do I need to know? And it begins to have people stop thinking about, I'm a senior director, I know everything, to I'm a senior director because they know everything and I listen to them. And there's a lot of power in that, both in terms of the role of a senior, you know, so that's my middle manager. Um, there's a lot of power in that for them because they now know how to be successful just kind of through the illustration of the game. So that's one of the ways that we've implemented systems thinking learning in the organization. It begins to open up dialogue in a really fascinating way. All right, so I'm just pause and say thoughts, comments, questions. And you had a question earlier that I said we would bring back up, so now I think it's the time. So what thoughts are you guys having, comments, questions? What do you think? Yeah. I just want to offer something that I try to do. We, we recently did some management skill training at our organization, and yeah. everyone on our team went through learning about ladder of inference. We talk about it sometimes, but one of the things that I do as a mental exercise, if I'm having a reaction to something that a person did, mm -hmm. I try to substitute in my mind, if it's the person I like the most who did it, how would I have reacted? Wow. It can be, and I try to pick yeah. like a loved one. I try to pick yes. someone you know, in the workplace, mm -hmm. and that is, it's like a little thing, and it, yeah. it kind of makes your mouth drop. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I just offer that up as when you're really, because they're usually you're frustrated by the same people over and over again, mm -hmm. but your reaction tends to just perpetuate mm -hmm. the problem. The problem. Yeah. If you can't arrest it. So. Yeah. Great, great strategy. Thank you for sharing. Other thoughts or comments or things to share? Okay. What was your question earlier? Do you remember? Uh, I just want, my question was, uh, are there any strategies that we can share uh, for working um, towards a learning environment, uh, creating a learning environment, when you really have a culture okay. that is, is not supportive yeah. of, of learning? Yeah. I, I work in higher ed. Um. <laughs> and, and I, well, it's not higher, I mean, that's one of the reasons that higher ed is in the, the situation that it's in. Higher ed traditionally would love to be, I mean, they'd love you to think of it that way, but it's a culture of experts. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a culture of research. It's not a learning organization. Mm -hmm. So um, that, that's yeah. kind of where I, yeah. And I think, so I think it's a, Jerry's got something he wants to contribute. I think it's a great point, and I suspect lawyers are the same, physicians are for sure the same. Um, researchers, epidemiologists, PhD level epidemiologists, <laughs> universally that is, you know, if you're, if, if you're dealing with your population is like uber educated, they're a tell not learn culture, right? And they, and they share it through the white papers that they publish that are 18 pages long that normal people can't read. And so what we've done, and then Jerry, I'm going to have, have you share, what we've done is we've come to them and said, tell us the coolest thing you've figured out this year. <laughs> That, and, and tell it to us in a way that we can translate it so all of our staff benefit it from when they work in the field. So, you know, become a translator is what we've done in the American history. It may or may not work in higher ed, but how can you become a translator of their expertise knowledge that feeds their ego, but gives their staff something that they can grow from, which then creates dialogue in a very different way. So, that's one, one thing we've done. Jerry, do you have a... Yeah, I mean, I, I think whenever, whenever I hear the, the sort of story of, you know, leaders that aren't supportive, um, you know, I, I guess it's situational, but it seems really odd because taking support or not support off the table, I think there's a fundamental question, what's the strategy behind the learning organization? What problems are you trying to solve? And why does, leaders either recognize those to be real problems or they do not, and if they don't recognize them to be real problems, then you know, somewhere there's that gap, and until you solve that gap, you're not really going to be effective, in my opinion, because you're solving problems that leadership doesn't really exist. So if you're doing, like, if you're doing learning to learn, that's probably problematic as well, right? That, 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 that's willing to learn and say, if somebody justifying their job, that, that feels weird too, right? I mean, I think it has to be what problems are you trying to solve with learning? And if you're looking, and there could be opportunities too, but I mean, there have to be new opportunities, right? So, um, I tend to push back when somebody says, oh, you know, we just don't get any leadership support for them. Okay, well, let's talk about that, right? What's, what problems are you trying to solve? What opportunities are you going after? And why doesn't leadership or people, you know, want it, right? Like, there are things that will probably get the, the people you work for very upset. 
right? They're probably things that people really want. I think it's, it's you know, we say often that leadership must inspire, but I think part of that is inspiring people to learn, right? And as learning leaders, if you're not able to inspire that, right, and people want it, you know, I don't know what the, the framework is that will necessarily fix that, because if you're not actually solving those real problems with people getting real value from the experience, you know, it's not going to work. And, and I think that one of the things I would add, and I don't even know you said something today, and I don't know if you meant it, but <laughs> I don't want to just check out on this, because you said, <laughs> as a lawyer, you probably did, but you said, <laughs> The cost of us not training is malpractice losses. And I would actually challenge that. I would say, if it's training that prevents you from having malpractice, I worry about the quality of your hiring of attorneys, right? Like, you've got to start in that step before that. And I'm saying, like, I, I, I'm just saying, like, I only challenge it because I hear often when people use learning and it becomes this, this thing, but if you actually challenge the strategy of it, like, really, this is for malpractice? Of course, you're going to backpedal and say, no, it's not. Like, not really. Like, there are some things that are super important as a law changes and all that. We, we get a much more clarified, like, narrowing down to what the reality of that is, right? But I think that's the obligation of the learning organization, right, is to actually do that narrowing and making sure that you're solving real problems that actually exist, that learning is the right tool for. And if it's not, then you shouldn't do it. Because right? I think you end up damaging the learning organization's reputation in the long term. And I, I, would, I would just echo the comment in that, that one of the ways that you can be a, an effective guerrilla talent development organization is by aligning very clearly, very specifically to business outcomes. Mm -hmm. Everything that we do at the American Cancer Society aligns to a specific out business outcome that my, that my owners of properties and products have put forward. So we roll out a comprehensive account management sales training this year because we're changing from a relationship building to a, a consultative selling skills organization. We've been a consultative selling skills organization for decades. We're now calling it that, we're naming it. Good, it's good stuff. We're, we're selling life-saving solutions to hospital systems, to new communities. So when you, when you create learning opportunities that align to those business outcomes, it doesn't actually matter if your executives get learning and learning culture because you can create learning opportunities that align to a business strategy that do what you're trying to do, which is create a learning culture. So you have to kind of think, so if your boulder is in the middle of your stream, what is, what is the best way to get around the boulder to be effective that drives training, drives outcomes, and creates culture around it? We've got a hand here and then a hand here. Yeah. I love what you said about being the translator of the expert's work. And I'm wondering, do you take those really engaging, compelling stories, and do you, um, do you use them to both educate your market and your staff? Yes. And yeah. how do you, how do you, are you also marketing? Do you, like, how do you make that happen? Um, no, I don't personally, my marketing team does. Mm -hmm. But anytime we're looking, anytime we find a story, a gem of a story, a lot of times it's from a survivor and the community has been willing to share. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's from a participant in an event. Sometimes it's from you know one of our researchers. One of our, we have 37 Nobel laureates in the world. You know what they have got something compelling to say, and then we kind of all right. How can we cut and paste this to make it most meaningful? And these people love to talk about their stuff. So to be asked a couple times to you know let's do this, let's do that. That seems to really work. Yeah. 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 So yeah. 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 I just had a question about you know aligning your learning programs. Mm -hmm. around either patient engagement, hospital engagement, corporate engagement, or really dollars for distance team members. And so with training, we're not, we at this point, we have not been asked, and nor we, do we guarantee any kind of growth or percentage. But when our field staff and our field leaders and our and the business owners come to us and say, here's our gap, we work with them to say, here's how we'll fill it. And we hide soft skills training in that. So it becomes a kind of a, a job training that 
that has soft skill manager development, leadership development, um, programs embedded in. Does that help a little bit? Uh, we have so, yeah. So, yeah. Okay, so you're, you, you, you have, they've identified a gap for you to help them with. So yes. So it's a business issue that you need to help address. Yes. Address, and then you're tying your kind of soft programs in with the... The, the tactical job training. Okay. Packaging it, if you and would. And then you bring back an outcome for them? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we do um, impact the job, made my job easier, organizational impact, um, you know, all that kind of stuff. We do that um, at one week, three week, th one week, three weeks, and six mo uh, three months and six months out. So, and we do that embedded a lot in our um, our Spark, which is our kind of retention program with, with content. So have you gained more support because you've been able to bring back that kind of information? From the business owners themselves, absolutely. Yeah, they're they're really excited about the stuff we've been able to produce for them. Yeah. So Jerry's got a question, and then I have to move on because we're almost done. Just a quick question. You mentioned that you had a high soft skills in there. Yeah. Why is that? Um, just that's my boulder. My boulder is I have a COO who doesn't really believe in soft skill training. Right. Mm -hmm. And I mean, and that's my reality. And I, that's okay. You know, I I choose to work there. So, you know, I have to package it up in a way that gives soft skill training into the hands of people where they can be used it powerfully, but it, it aligns very specifically to their job. Now, we know that they can use influencer skills any job they have ever. But if we, if we can tie it to something that they're trying to do at their current role, then it becomes much more palatable to our senior most executives. That's, but that's... You know, it's a, it's a boulder, and it's, a, it's an executive level boulder, but I don't have to do that all the time because my, the next line down, my senior vice president and vice presidents, they largely get it. So that's, you know, that's my reality. How do I package my funding to make sure I'm meeting their needs? Make sense? Yeah. Okay. So the last, the last item on our pyramid was team learning. Um, Couple of key things, and these, these three uh, bullets come from a Harvard Business Review article that's referenced in the stock in your handout. Also, creating a supportive learning environment. One of the things that we've done at the at the American Cancer Society is really create open forum conversation so that's knowledge. We don't keep knowledge, and we don't encourage our folks to keep knowledge. We use Yammer, and we have vast numbers of um, social learning communities that are on Yammer. That we, when someone enrolls in a class, our consultative selling skills class. We drive them to Yammer to see what's going on, check references, learn about what the stuff the training is going to be about. They go to the training, then we take them back to Yammer through things that we call Sparks, which is basically a retention tool. It shows up in their inbox. Maybe it's a video, maybe it's a question, maybe it's a quiz. It takes them back into the Yammer community to, to share what's been successful. And what's really cool about that is then we started to see, oh my gosh, went to the consultative selling skills training, used the process. Went from a twelve thousand dollar gift to a fifty thousand dollar gift. Like that, that feeds culture in a way that you cannot train. So how are you driving them to converse with each other? We're we're you know we have seven thousand staff across the country, and they're all talking about it in the Yammer community. So that's one of the ways that we create a a, a supportive learning environment. Um, on my team, one of the ways that we that we really honor the not keeping knowledge to yourselves is we have this rule called inappropriate questions. Anybody at any time can ask me publicly, email, I am on a team call, and what we what, what I termed an inappropriate question. Nine times out of ten, it's not inappropriate at all. It's just a little scary, right? You know, our organization's had a rough year. What does that look like for our budget? Or you know, it's it's, it's a scary question. It's not an appropriate question. And if they're thinking it, chances are others are also. But they know that I will answer it because I've been doing it for years, candidly, honestly, to the extent that I can. If it's if it's top secret, I say, here's what I can share. You know, and they know that I will share everything else when I get there. So, and that kind of that opens up since I'm transparent, they're transparent with each other, and we have, um, when we have conflict, it's really productive conflict for that reason. Because we're walking down the ladder, we're using it to create and storm, and then get creativity out of it versus just kind of butting heads. You know, you've got 56 humans, they're gonna have conflict, period. Concrete learning processes, we've all got learning management systems, we've all got a human university, we've all got all those things, that's great. Is it easy? Is it a boulder? 
Um, is it clean? Is it simple? Is it, you know, what are you doing with what you've got? Also, what are you doing to support informal learning processes? On my team, every other Friday, we have a standing call called a sandbox call. The idea is kind of playing the sand with each other. And anybody can sign up to facilitate it on my team. Bring a concept, bring an article, bring something cool you learned at the conference last week, and share it and teach it back to your peers. It is amazing. I have a very virtual team. We've only been in tech, this, this version of the team has only been in tech for a year. And it's been amazing things bringing them together in a virtual space. So, what are you doing to create learning culture sharing on your team? Um, finally, le re leadership reinforcing learning. So, what are you doing to be open to alternative viewpoints? Not just with your team, but with your clients. Can I learn from my clients? Absolutely. If they have hard feedback to give me about something that we're doing or not doing, I want to hear it. And the minute they learn that I'm not defensive about something that we've dropped or missed or missed a mark, they're like, oh, and my whole theory is if you don't tell me, I can't be you. I can't help you. I have to know. What are you feeding me? So that kind of open leader, leadership reinforcing learning and your interactions with peers, with your interaction with your team, and then looking to have them model it with their clients also. Everywhere we have a client, we're trying to model this behavior. Um, we train these fundamentals, you know, kind of below the tree line, the gorilla concept, we train these fundamentals in our manager development program, our leadership development program, our manager fundamentals, our boot camp, and then we offer performance consulting and facilitate performance consulting and facilitation support to teams um, to help kind of drive it and continue it. So that's kind of some of the things that we do tactically to support the process in terms of team learning. Team Make sense? Okay. So. All of this is really cool, maybe, maybe it's really cool, maybe it's not, I don't know, you'll have to decide for yourself and you can put it on my evaluation form, but this is what we've done at ACS. Honestly, at the end of the day, is you have to make this your own. It has to work for your organization, just like Peter Senge said to me, well, those many years ago, you're going to have to tell me how it works for you, because everybody's got a different challenge, different boulder, different opportunity. Um, but if you, if you feel like you have a counterculture, it doesn't, don't let it stop you. You can do it, you can, you can create it for yourself, and you can create it with your clients where you have the most influence. And that's where you have some power and choice, right? That's where the work can become really fun. And then if you've got that amazing leader, good for you. You know, that's awesome. So what can you do to drive it to the next level? Um, the site for organizational learning is a reference. The, that's the um, Harvard Business Review article I referenced. The, um, the Harvard Business Review has a diagnostic tool how are you doing in align to the, the learning culture? It's on your handout, that's it, it's free. Um, and then I actually blog about personal vision and mastery. I have a personal blog about personal vision and mastery. If that's something that's interesting to you, you can check me out at biglifevision.com. So, thank you to Trident for having us here. Thanks for listening. Thank you. And thank you to the American Cancer Society for letting you come out. Yeah. Trident is really honored to partner with the American Cancer Society uh, and the Extending Tuition Discount. You guys are fantastic to work with. And I recognize I am the only thing between you and your own beer project out here. <laughs> so I don't want to take a lot of time. I do just want to say this. Um, Trident University, we are a quiet organization. You're not going to see billboards here, radio ads. That's not how we roll. Um, there are four of us here this week. We'd love to tell you about what we do and how we do it. We've served active duty military for many years. We found that if you can help the busiest working adults get a degree, we do really well. Also working in the civilian sector as well with corporations and our partners. We'd love to talk to you about it. We won't back you into a corner to do so, but if you'd like to chat, we'd love to talk to you. If it's your first time in Southern California, if you're not from here, I apologize for the two clouds in the sky. We'll try and get a fix for you by tomorrow. But uh, CLO is a fantastic time. I hope you have a great time. Enjoy our beautiful piece of the country. And uh, thanks again for attending today. Appreciate it. Thank you.